Do we have a horizontal asymptote for this function? Yes. Hmm. What's the degree of the numerator? Zero. It's degree zero. The degree of the denominator is degree two. So do we have a horizontal asymptote? Yes, when the bottom is bigger than the top, that's y equals zero, because we're dividing by a really big number, so the overall result is a very small number. Now, y equals zero is our x-axis, so you're just going to have to put a thicker dashed line there on your x-axis. Okay, You still need the axis, but then go back over it with a thicker dashed line um, that's what you have to do when it's on one of your axes. Now, for a whole, I got a factor, right? So if I factor this expression, the numerator can't be factored. I mean, yes, we could write it as negative 2 times 2, but that's not the factoring we're concerned with. The bottom, we can take out a GCF of x. Okay, that's x times x minus 3. But nothing cancels, so we don't have a hole, no holes. Vertical asymptote. We take what's left in the denominator. We've got x, and we have x minus 3. So we've got x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote, and we have x equals 3 is a vertical asymptote. So we have two vertical asymptotes here. That happens sometimes. So x equals 0 is the y-axis. So put you a thicker dashed line on the y-axis. And x equals 3, put you a dashed line there when x equals 3. All right. So we've got all our asymptotes in there. X-intercept. For the x-intercept, we said we set the numerator equal to 0 and solve for x. Well, our numerator is negative 4. Does negative 4 equal 0? Not in my world. I don't know about yours, but negative 4 is not equal to 0 in the mathematical world. So we don't have an x-intercept. That's possible. Not all functions cross the x-axis. Some parabolas don't cross the x-axis. Some rational functions don't cross the x-axis. Okay, y-intercept, we plug in 0 for x. Well, what happens when we plug in 0 for x? We get negative 4 divided by 0. That's a no-no. That's not okay. That's undefined. We don't have a y-intercept either. If the y-axis is a vertical asymptote, you're not going to have a y-intercept. If you have a vertical asymptote of x equals 0, aka the y-axis, you are not going to have a y-intercept because you don't ever touch a vertical asymptote. Okay, so this is a little different. We don't have any points. We had points to go by on the last one. And on this one, we have like six chunks here to fill in. Well, six chunks where we could potentially have a graph because we have two vertical asymptotes as opposed to one. So, anybody have any ideas of what we could do without just grabbing our calculator? What's a strategy that we can use to graph any function? What is a graph? I mean, what, what is a graph? Let's just get to the, the basis of this. Where does a graph come from? How do we end up with a line? For a linear function, where does that line come from? It doesn't just appear out of the blue. The slope, okay, the slope and the y-intercept, okay. Um, let's make it a little bit more complicated. What about with a, with a parabola, with a quadratic function? Where do all those points come from? What are we doing when we plug in an x and we get a 
number L. What does that give us? It gives us a point on the graph, right? We pick an X, we plug it in, we get a Y, that gives us a point that's on the graph. If we pick all the possible X's, we get all the possible Y's, we plot all those possible points, that's where the graph comes from. So when push comes to shove, if we're trying to graph something and we don't know what it looks like, we don't, it's not a line, so we can't just use the slope and the y-intercept. It's not a parabola, so we can't just find its vertex and, and draw from there. What can we do? We can pick points, plug them into the function, get their y values, and then we have points to fill in the graph. So, let's be strategic about this. Since we know there are kind of portions of the graph here, how about we start with an x value to the left of x equals 0. So what's a nice number, easy number to deal with to the left of 0? Negative 1. Negative 1. I like negative 1. Lovely things happen when we have negative 1. So I'm going to say x equals negative 1. I'm going to plug it into my function. Now, I'm going to use the factored form just because it typically makes dealing with numbers a little bit easier. You can plug it into the original if you want. Uh, I just don't like dealing with exponents with negative numbers. Um, so negative 4 over negative 1 is positive 4. Negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. So that gives us a y value of negative 1. So we have the point negative 1, negative 1 that we can plot on our graph. Let's pick a number there in the middle. What's a good number between 0 and 3? Okay, 1 and a half. Let's see what happens when we plug in 1 and a half. Negative 4 over 1.5 times 1.5 minus 3. Mm, it might not be so pretty, but that's okay. Uh, let's see here. 1.5 minus 3 is negative 1.5. Uh, I'm going to turn those into fractions because that's easier to deal with. So that's negative 9 over 4, which is, if I flip and multiply, 16 over 9. Yes, we can do 1 and 2. Um, but let's see here, 16 over 9, that's a little bit less than 2. So I got a point right there. See you, Tyler. Hang on, let me give you this worksheet. Do you remember the ones that were about the same grand? No, no, no. Okay, so if we pick one, one and two, they're not so bad. I promise. One and two is not so bad. If we plug in one, we get negative four over one times one minus three. That's negative four over negative two. That's two. That's. Exactly. Life's not easy. Face some adversity. Not a big deal. Uh, let's plug in 2. Negative 4 over 2 times 2 minus 3. That's negative 2 over negative 1, which is 2. Well, there's some nice symmetry. All right, uh, that's enough there in the middle, so let's pick a number that's bigger than 3. What's a good number for that 4? I like 4. Negative 4 over 4 times 4 minus 3. Well, that's negative 1. So, based on what we just looked at in the last problem and kind of what we know about rational functions, I feel pretty confident about filling this in approach the asymptotes that's not close enough Do that again okay approach the horizontal asymptote right here approach the vertical asymptote now if I really wanted to I could plug in those other numbers and and check that uh, infinity and stuff closer to the vertical asymptotes but we're just gonna roll with this okay your function should always be approaching the asymptotes Not touching, not crossing. 
there are three portions to this uh, rational function because there are two vertical asymptotes. Okay, you're, for every vertical asymptote, you're splitting your graph into more portions. You have one, and you're going to have two pieces. You have two, and you're going to have three pieces. If you were to have three, then you would have one, two, three, four pieces. I've honestly never really seen that happen. I'm sure it's possible, but I've never been in a problem with that. Okay. So, interesting little parabola there in the middle. You can plug this into your calculator. If you don't believe me, graph it. Okay, negative 4 over. Make sure you get parentheses around the x squared minus 3x in the denominator. And there it is. Okay, that's what I was saying. Yes, you can. You will have your calculator at your disposal. Okay, but I'm expecting your asymptotes to be exact. I'm expecting your holes to be exact. And future-wise, if you take a class beyond this, you're going to have to know how to do this without a calculator. In this class, technically, yes, you can plug it into your calculator and you can go from there. But looking to the future, you need this. In But push comes to shove, yes, you can plug it into your calculator and you can go from there. But you've got to make sure that you have the dotted asymptotes, the holes, all that good stuff.